Good, name, good evening, my name is Karen Planet. I'm the president of AI Ohio. Welcome to today's program, Mediation, presented by Sung Ho Kim and Heather Wolfter of Axiom. Tonight's lecture is a sixth and final lecture in the 2021 series presented by AI Ohio this year. Before we start today's program, I would like to recognize and thank our 2021 AI Ohio annual sponsors highlighted on the screen now. Our sponsors are important partners who have helped us bring this innovative and quality program we're enjoying this year. I'd also like to thank all of those who have made donations to the AI Ohio Foundation as part of the registration process for the lecture series. For those members wishing to make a larger impact on the future of the profession, please consider joining me and our fellow members listed on the screen who have invested a minimum of $1,000 in lifetime giving to the AI Ohio Foundation. Before we get started, I'd like to highlight a few of AI Ohio's upcoming programs. Our third series this year, entitled Practice Innovation, will be starting soon with the first session of the six-part series beginning on Tuesday, September 14th, with a session titled Recognizing the Added Value of Research and Practice. The AI Ohio Design Awards will be virtual this year and will be on Thursday, September 30th. Save the date and plan on joining us when we will announce and celebrate AI Ohio's award recipients, Design Award recipients. We will also be announcing winners of the AI Ohio Student Design Competition featuring projects from Ohio Schools of Architecture. Just a few housekeeping items. Our program today is scheduled for one and a half hours, including about 20 minutes for Q&A at the end of the program. If you have questions during the presentation, please enter them in the chat box. At the end of the program, we'll be looking to the chat box to identify participants who would like to ask questions of our speakers. A link will be placed in the chat box as well towards the end of the pre presentation. If you follow the link, you can enter your information and member number so you'll receive your learning units for today's program. Finally, I'd like to thank Robert Maschi for selecting the speakers and Dave Robar for uh, his introductions this evening of our speakers and moderating the Q&A. Um, it's really been a great year for our lecture series. I appreciate everybody who's joined us today. And now I'd like to turn the program over to Dave to introduce our design speakers for this evening's program. Dave. Great, thank you, Karen. Uh, welcome everybody. Um, thanks again for joining us. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Sung Ho Kim and Heather Woofter from Axiome uh, LLC in St. Louis. Heather Woofter studied biochemistry as a teenager at the University of Maryland, a teenager in chemical engineering at Virginia Polytechnic Institute. She received a Bachelor of Architecture from Virginia Polytechnic Institute and a Master of Architecture from Harvard University Graduate School of Design. She is a founding co-director and owner of Axiomi LLC of St. Louis with Sung Ho Kim. Sung Ho Kim studied drawing and sculpture as a teenager at the Arts Student League of New York in a Harvard Graduate School of Design career discovery program. He received a Bachelor of Fine Arts and Bachelor of Architecture from Rhode Island School of Design and an AA diploma from Architectural Association of London, UK with the Royal Institute of British Architects, part one and part two. He also received his Master's in, Sci Master in Science and Architecture Studies from Massachusetts Institute of Technology. He was, co he was founding director of Axiomi of Providence, Rhode Island from 2001 and has been co-director of Axiomi LLC of St. Louis with Heather Woofter since 2003. So with that, I'll turn it over to you guys and thank you very much. Thank you, David. And we would like to thank Robert Maschke, Kate Brunswick and David again for inviting us to this presentation. Hi, everyone. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here today. Um, we'd like to talk a little bit about uh, St. Louis and our projects in the city. Uh, we're both academics and practitioners, and um, you know that creates a, a certain amount of tension. And, and working in St. Louis is a really unique um, kind of distinct kind of zone of, uh, of practice. And so we've entitled the, the talk today, Mediation. I think mediation, we immediately think of arbitration or intervention. Um, you know, historically it was defined as two equal parts or finding a division in the middle. Um, and historically uh, kind of it had this context of being intermediate, a state of intermediate. Um, 
Working in St. Louis, uh, you can imagine as very contentious uh, space. Uh, and this kind of image of the arch grounds is a hopeful one. Uh, and it's often heralded as, uh, you know, one of the kind of urban land um, kind of movements in the city that has brought it into the next generation. Uh, but the arch grounds themselves were deeply politically divided. And, and that narrative uh, has shifted over time in terms of how it's told. Um, it is heralded as the gateway to the West, um, but you know many uh, Black and immigrant uh, families lost their jobs when the Land Clearance Act um, kind of cleared this particular site. Um, and St. Louis is known for uh, the movement of populations of people and disinvestment of uh, certain neighborhoods. Um, and so over time, you know, there are a series of different contradictions that start to be raised about the, the place in which we live and how we occupy land. Um, and mediation implies a balance of power. And we often find ourselves in different positions, uh, us in positions of power and others in positions of power. And we're trying to work in that kind of uh, contradictory environment. Um, and so we'll, we'll begin with that context um, because I think it impacts what we do uh, as academics and practitioners. You know, we, we teach at WashU, uh, which is sort of a bit of the, it has the nickname in St. Louis of being the castle on the hill. Uh, and quite literally, as you can see from the image, it is somewhat the castle on the hill. Um, but we really need to understand the cultural forces that shape our world and the context in which we work and WashU has declared as their sort of central um, kind of strategic planning mission for the next 10 years, we have a new chancellor, a new provost, um, and there's really a sense of building momentum and having greater impact in St. Louis. There's lots of work that has already happened, um, but following through on a lot of the promises and the potential um, is really important. And I think WashU wants to set uh, a standard in terms of interdisciplinary models um, for other regions um, and think globally and systemically about the problems that, you know, Rust Belt cities are facing, primarily those are racism, healthcare, social resource disparity, economic and environmental justice issues, and also urban fragmentation. Um, so just to give you a sense, the building on the on the left side of my screen is Givens Hall, which is a historic building of, of WashU architecture program. And on the right, a new building uh, called Weill Hall. Um, and this is the context in which uh, we live and work. Um, we're showing you a map uh, just to situate you in St. Louis. And I'm sure that there are quite a few people um, watching the show that are familiar with the city. Um, but you can see the Mississippi River. Um, and the arch grounds are located to the east. And you know, all the way west, uh, in terms of this diagram, you can see the WashU academic campus uh, at the other end of this image, kind of separated from the city by Forest Park. And uh, St. Louis is made up of a, a series of different park systems. You know, we have the um, Fairground Park up here to the north, Tower Grove Park to the south, uh, the arch grounds to the east and uh, forest park um, here to the west. Um, and, and through this central corridor, uh, we have separation of north and south. And a number of projects, uh, which many of you are familiar with, the pruitt Igo project, uh, the NGA, um, which I'll talk about uh, for just a minute, project um, here to the north. Uh, I'm going to talk just a second about Peace Park. Um, we have the Mill Creek Value Valley, which is an area of historic um, disinvestment and also relocation of a very strong and prominent um, Black American families from that, from that region. Um, Fairground Park, which is a disinvested uh, kind of set of neighborhoods surrounding it. Um, and then our medical school campus, which is uh, quite robust. Um, you know, as academics, we work both in our practice, Axiomi, but we also work on research projects. And we're just gonna give you a couple examples because I think it, it frames the kind of work we can do in those different settings. 
Uh, this is a project that I worked on uh, called Divided City and collaborated um, with, a, with a, two scholars. Um, and uh, we were looking at the NGA, which is the National Geospatial Agency. Uh, it was located in one area of St. Louis. It was very controversial because they moved uh, to uh, an area in the north, just, just north of pruitt Igo site. So at one point they thought they were gonna move into the pruitt Igo site. But in fact, they have cleared the pruitt Igo site and cleared the area to the north. It's a very large section of North St. Louis that is historically predominantly black. Um, and those uh, that were living there, their area was completely disinvested um, to the point where the land values were very, very low. Uh, and the city turned over this property to the NGA. Um, which has a proposal to, uh, you can see it's, they're starting construction now, um, but, you know, introduce a massive facility, which is drawn very um, kind of softly here, but traditionally has a series of barriers and fences um, surrounding it because of the highly confidential nature of what they do there. Um, and you can see an image to the bottom right of existing pruitt Igo uh, that no longer exists uh, and a church uh, that was very pro prominent that's been destroyed. And then the you know, kind of image we all know, the end of modernism in, so in some respects and social housing uh, through pruitt Igo. And in 2004, uh, when we first got to WashU, we brought a, uh, artist named Krista Wudzitsko to St. Louis to do a projection to give voice to the kind of marginalized population of the community. We did a projection on the, uh, the historical courthouse, but then uh, the government decided that they didn't want to take on the courthouse and then the kind of the complexity of the, the voices that we wanted to project. So it was relocated to the, uh, the public library, but we we're able to kind of test out these issues of segregation and uh, narrative of different communities, especially immigrant and then uh, disfranchised uh, minority groups. And we were using the building and the monuments as a way, as a voice for the people who are invisible to the context of the city. Sorry. Oops. There we go. Um, and uh, this is an image of Fairground Park. Uh, again, you know, one of our ambitions is to bring practice and uh, community together uh, in a more meaningful way with the academy and starting programs uh, looking at different disciplines, engineering, uh, the Brown School of Social Work, our um, public health program um, through BJC. Uh, and thinking about how we can collaborate together. Um, this is a project that uh, was initiated um, Jason, by Jason Purnell of Health Equity Works for several years working with community members. And he thought that they'd want a health um, proposal uh, to, er, to impact the neighborhood and um, kind of correct some of the environmental injustice issues that are present. And instead, the community wanted a park. They wanted a physical space that was taken care of, um, that was built specifically around some of the programming needs that they had. The reason that I'm just showing you, I'm involved in this in terms of putting together the team, interdisciplinary teams of um, uh, kind of faculty that are working with community members. Um, but you know, it really kind of goes to the heart of uh, the complexity of working in the community and the number of years that it might take to, uh, to really establish those partnerships and then to provide a kind of meaningful service um, back. Uh, and so, um, you know, the complexity of being an academic practicing is something that I think we talk about uh, as in terms of mediation and that's shifting and changing as we receive more institutional support. And the city itself, this is um, an image from the brick line. This is not a project that, that we have designed. I'm on the design oversight committee. And, um, but this is a project happening in St. Louis right now, which is stitching together through greenways, um, uh, a series of connective paths and tissue uh, to establish connections across St. Louis. Uh, and during the competition, one of the local uh, competition groups, which had local practitioners and academics um, in that group, 
you know, had really emphasized the north-south connection. So these connections are not um, merely connections of sort of industry, but really trying to think about how our neighborhoods are disinvested and separated um, through the communities in, in which they either have resources or do not have resources. Um, and so this is the context in which we work. <laughs> um, and so it is, it is quite uh, uh, fruitful. And at the same time, you know, we need to be very uh, cautious about how we approach projects. When we first started practicing, I think we were quite naive, um, but we did have some incredible opportunities and also fantastic uh, community uh, member engagement um, through local kind of media and arts organizations. And so we want to talk about our journey a little bit and, um, and then relate that back to, I think, uh, a growing sense of maturity about how to approach these projects. So this is image of Grand Center in St. Louis. And in you know turn of century uh, in 1900s grand center was a very robust urban place with cable cars retail and it was that area near grand center was considered second largest automotive manufacturing besides detroit so it was a very kind of an active city um and here we are kind of looking at an image of, of Grand Center, which is a place where we've done a number of projects um, from the time that we first arrived in St. Louis. And I don't know if you can see my mouse, but um, the St. Louis Symphony is, is located uh, here. Grand Boulevard runs uh, north uh, to south. Um, and so you can see through this image that uh, kind of density that was present mm -hmm. at one point in the city uh, there was a kind of mass exodus of, of residents from the city into the suburbs of St. Louis. And St. Louis has often been um, kind of equated to like someone with a smile with a lot of missing teeth. <laughs> In other words, a lot of the property is, is abandoned um, or we have a lot of vacated um, areas that are kind of uh, has a lot of potential now. You can see those as green sites and quite a bit of parking lot um, infrastructure to accommodate all the kind of uh, people coming in from the suburbs that are coming here for cultural events and then exiting the city. And that, that's been a problem. Anything else? Yeah. And then this is the kind of the photo we took last winter. And there's, when Heather was talking about missing lots where these buildings used to be, and now they're all kind of desolated uh, landscape. And so we've, we've worked on uh, a number of projects um, here in Grand Center. And just as an introduction, Olive Boulevard is here where my, where my mouse is. Um, I think I can maybe annotate. So this is Olive. And here we have Grand, uh, which is a primary sort of intersection mm -hmm. in Grand Center. And we've worked on 10 different projects in this region. Um, and the projects that we're gonna talk about are the, the Media Technology Center, which is on this triangular site, number one. It happens to be the low point in terms of the uh, uh, kind of elevation of Grand Center. So a lot of water is collected there. Um, and we'll talk about the public television station, which is number two on this diagram. And number three, four, nine, and 10 <laughs> really have to do with the public media commons, which is bringing together a television station and a radio station, public radio, um, you know, into conversation with one another um, and the strategies involved there. We need. So the first project we're going to talk about is called Media Arcade in Grand Center. It's on a triangulated site, very complex. And uh, this was our, Heather and myself, it was our kind of first collaboration of a kind of a design process. 
So we learned a lot about each other and how we run a practice. It was a very, stay on this image. It was a really complicated um, site. Uh, again, quite naive. We, we were working for a developer who had a loose agreement with the owner of the uh, this garage. And there were a number of uh, donors in Grand Center that were supporting the project. Um, you know, we were kind of held apart mm -hmm. because we were providing design services and we were under uh, contract for that. Um, and we were told that there was an agreement in place um, and it was being negotiated through SLU, St. Louis uh, University members um, there. Uh, and in the end, the garage owner, it was a black owned business, uh, you know, felt disinvested that the city wasn't offering the right price for the property. Um, and it became kind of a very uh, contested project uh, that we were sort of in some ways protected because we were outside of all of those conversations but we were quite naive in terms of um, being asked to speculate about a site uh, while still being kind of held at arm's length um, from the person that owned the property. Um, so we started out with kind of designing a uh, ground level arcade that you could use for media. That means you could project onto the surface of the ground or around the building's face. And it was retail and kind of public space on the first level. Second level would be uh, institution program for classrooms for SLU. And the third would be uh, apartment complexes or uh, housing for visiting or fellows from different parts of the university. And we were receiving input from many organizations, KETC, which is the television station, the Pulitzer Foundation, Sheldon Art Gallery, the concert hall, um, Fox Theater. Uh, essentially, this area of Grand Center was built like a series of bunkers <laughs> that were solid and kind of impenetrable. And uh, there was quite a bit of vandalism. The streets were completely abandoned, except when there was a big event and everyone from the suburbs drives in and then, you know, parks there. And we have lots of bustling activity as they go from their car to the, to the event, but then it's all vacant again. Um, and so the idea that had been uh, kind of conveyed to us and we were asked to sort of think and speculate around this idea is how do we turn some of the, that kind of public media interest inside out and have a space that could be open at the ground level where anybody can walk and feel free to participate in like an arcade like fashion. Um, but then we can have other kinds of program built onto and into this project to sustain it um, and that it would, in a way, kind of similar to a lot of the work that Sung Ho um, did for, for years earlier, kind of act as a voice of public media um, where those in the community can voice out through uh, a, a sort of a skin um, that talks about media and communication. So this is how the skin operates as it wraps around the triangulated site and the housing is above has kind of a slanted green roof. And then uh, classrooms puncture out their large windows through the skin. And then the large ramp that goes up to the second and third floor, leaving the ground floor empty for public use and uh, uh, plaza events. It was a place for skateboarders mm -hmm. and uh, like a video arcade mm -hmm. and you know something that would attract youth to come in mm -hmm. and, uh, and engage uh, that community in a positive way. Um, and you can see the skin wrapping around at one of the uh, other elevations and then classrooms popping out the skin. And this is basically what it looks like with movies and events and information being projected onto the surface of the skin. Uh, the project sort of erupted in a lot of uh, media and attention of the negative kind. <laughs> and, um, you know, the property was maintained, um, but the idea of some sort of communication space never mm -hmm. sort of left the ambitions of uh, the institutions that are on this block. Um, and so, you know, we were working with a developer who asked us the question, mm -hmm. if you could develop a site 
uh, anywhere in the city, you know, where do you think you could have an impact with some of the um, kind of strategies that you've been talking about? And, um, and we had had wonderful conversations with the public television station and also um, the arts organizations uh, here in Grand Center and thought that if there was a kind of turning inside out of public programming, uh, this really could be a nexus um, to rethink the way that this uh, kind of area of the city is um, uh, utilized by people from both, you know, different areas uh, of the city. So we began with Nine Network. So it's a site that was a uh, parking lot, uh, surface parking. And we thought that was a very interesting place because it lined up with a visual corridor with St. Louis University and the Fox Theater. So we felt that site was like a pivotal place of Grand Center. And we were hoping to activate all of the, um, the parking lots and mm -hmm. uh, kind of uh, take advantage of their kind of vacancy uh, that's significantly throughout the day. Um, and kind of the occupation of a bunch of people uh, coming to this site during the evening. Um, and our ideas first started materializing around a certain set of individuals that uh, helped us early on. And again, a very young practice um, uh, with Emily Pulitzer. Uh, we worked also with our good friends. Uh, they became our great friends, uh, developer. Um, Aaron and Nancy Novak. And then uh, supporters like Ken Kranzberg and uh, Jack Galmish, the CEO of the uh, TV station. And we like to show this model because this model started the conversation with all these people and brought the community together to have a kind of a vision. You can see the model is kind of rough model we built. <laughs> and it, there's a TV station and we were wrapping the TV stations kind of facade with projection surfaces. and having another new building that connects the two buildings together. And it was at that moment that, you know, we sort of stood in this parking lot um, and uh, with one of the donors, uh, Ken Kranzberg mm -hmm. saying, oh, you know, I see now what you guys mm -hmm. have been talking about. We could completely stitch together mm -hmm. this entire region, uh, uh, this district um, within St. Louis and it's been our pleasure, you know, we've been here for um, 17 years. I've been here for 17 and Sung Ho's been here for like 19, 20 yeah. years. Um, and they're still hard, you know, working towards that goal. Um, and so it was one of those moments where it seemed like anything was really possible. So we're gonna talk about Nine Network project, which is an interior project of a kind of an unfinished, unfinished space in. Uh, Channel 9, KTC. This was a really uh, great project for us as a small practice um, to start. They had a, a kind of um, unbuilt uh, kind of area of their existing building. Uh, and it was a TV station, so the ceilings are super high. And they wanted this community space. Ultimately, Jack Galmish uh, talked to us. Um, and isn't it wonderful when you have a client give you uh, like a yeah. book? <laughs> so he handed us a book on networks and said, um, you know, I really want this to be how we talk about this project, uh, which was fascinating. So he wanted to work with light and media and sort of intangible things to um, kind of invigorate the space, but also to bring all the community members into the building because they've never been welcomed into the building before something as simple as that. Um, so before we did any of the exterior work or created plazas or um, sort of talked about how we project onto surfaces, uh, it was really his desire to tackle um, the housing crisis, uh, a number of other issues in St. Louis with community members. And we were asked to make sort of a think tank space um, for that group. And at the center of that was uh, what we called the Beacon Table. There was a Beacon newspaper, which was an online journal uh, dedicated uh, to the community of St. Louis. Um, and they had both online pieces and also we used it as a, a television um, kind of screening area for complex conversations that happen around city issues. Um, so what was planned to be a, 
a kind of a working space. At one point, Jack looked at it and said, no, this needs to be the space that we also work with the community and we film. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what we did was we expanded the, uh, actually the interior. We projected the, uh, the conference room and one of the offices out into the public space. At the same time, we designed the tables and all the furniture and lighting that has responding, responding to the different coloration. And this is kind of a uh, photos of the space right before they moved in. And then this is the beacon table. It feels like this kind of a light field that kind of uh, transitions between the uh, normality of the space and then be, uh, the things that's kind of created uh, wraps around the space to kind of bring people together. The geometry is really based on the idea of a bullpen, mm -hmm. the old kind of news desk um, uh, that was given to us, you know, as a reference of how uh, kind of news was shared uh, kind of really quickly among um, people that are reporting out. So we were asked to kind of think about this space where people come together in a bullpen. And then these were some media walls elements that Jack asked us to use as a kind of a, a TV set <laughs> with multiple screens. And then the, these kind of just the screens aren't just attached to the wall, but they become an architectural furniture. And so this was right at the very beginning and we're working really carefully with um, fabricators that had recently graduated yeah. um, from WashU's program and uh, doing some of the construction ourselves on uh, these projects. So again, it was it was a little bit of a, a, a grunge yeah. band. <laughs> grunge band. <laughs> uh, in terms of, you know, trying to uh, carry out these projects on somewhat limited budgets um, with and a very deadlines. and <laughs> deadlines with a very excited uh, client. I will say that um, being an academic and practicing. Uh, you face a lot of um, kind of things that uh, you know you don't you don't really think about in the sense that you it's difficult because you don't have financial stability. Um, you're trying to run a, a practice while you're also teaching. Uh, there's no guarantees. You know we were both tenure track, and there's no guarantees that these projects are going to get built. So you actually need to start multiple things in order to hope that one or two or three. Um, materialize. Um, and and I, I, I think that it changes the context in, in which you work and, ha and sure. how you think about your audience and who you are working with mm -hmm. in terms of your collaborators and the timetable um, that you have to execute, execute those yeah. projects. And then as soon as we finished that interior project, we, were, we went through a huge journey to start the Amazon Grand Center. It's a radio station building with academic program. Yeah, so this project was, um, you know, our first sort of full scale uh, built project under the Axiomi mm -hmm. uh, name. And uh, it was done in collaboration with an architect of record uh, and developer team. Uh, and this also uh, kind of was an interesting story of what we would call negotiation or kind of being flexible and, and thinking about how we define our practice. Um, so we designed this project uh, over the summer mm -hmm. with uh, a developer that we um, ended up mm -hmm. quite good friends with and um, someone who's very active in the city. And uh, we worked on a charrette. There was a pricing exercise. Um, it came in around, mm -hmm. uh, I don't know, 11 12. million, 12 million. Right. Um, and so uh, because it was a competitive process, uh, it needed to be mm -hmm. put out to, to bid as a public project. Uh, you know, we were part of the requirement, I guess, um, uh, given the scale and, and size and kind of age of our practice, but, you know, our collaborator uh, developer slash architect team, uh, you know, it was out to bid um, and, and it was put out to bid as, uh, you know, kind of show us what you will uh, deliver for, you know, this budget with this design of a building um, and floor layout. Uh, and uh, so two teams had a sort of in, the one that we had worked with and another one that was uh, active on the television station. 
And then a third team came in with, without uh, those connections and said, okay, we have a totally different strategy. We're gonna come in and say that we can do this building for 5 million, um, which, is, yeah. which was, uh, uh, yeah, sort of surprising given the fact that it's uh, a public media building and there are a lot of technical kind of components in this project. Um, so UMSL, uh, you know, uh, again, a, a state school um, said, okay, um, they spent a year working on the contract. <laughs> so there was, there was a huge investment yeah. in that contract and in our roles and defining, you know, how this project would move forward. Um, but as part of the contract, they protected the exterior of the building, um, but not the interior. So uh, uh, because they had issued drawings that that showed the exterior in different kind of formality. Um, so we had the exterior protected, but not the interior. So it was a very unusual way of working for us to completely rethink, um, you know, how we uh, can eliminate close to half the cost of the building through efficiencies, um, but not be able to uh, sort of yeah. change the geometry of the building, which was driving some of the cost. Yeah. So at the same time, we developed a lot of kind of uh, strategies by diagramming and physical physical modeling to understand the geometry within the context of the site. So you can see that the, the building, we wanted it very much to fit within mm -hmm. the context. So. Um, you know, along Olive, uh, there are some phenomenal views, uh, and there's usually a separation between the sidewalk and the institution in most of the Grand Center um, kind of properties. So it was projected out onto that surface. The Art Walk project, which we'll talk about a little bit later, was conceptualized at the same time. Um, and uh, it really was about connecting SLU, uh, having a passageway through this media and arts uh, kind of technology core, and then connecting that up to the Hodiamont Trail. Uh, there was a bigger idea connecting it up to a bike path that would then um, sort of connect us to North St. Louis and the community there. And this plaza, this media plaza, would be that kind of moment of inflection where everyone comes together. And so there was a notion of projecting from uh, public radio onto the public television, also a notion of um, being able to uh, kind of occupy the building at, at different heights. And there were certain uh, kind of views that we were uh, working with as we thought about this transition. The large cantilever was um, really the kind of entrance way into the plaza from the SLU connection, which hadn't happened yet. So you can see here the cantilever and how he frames the kind of uh, entrance into the plaza and it becomes a entrance point into the building and that's the projection screen at the back and look and this is from the uh, meeting room looking out into the projection. So there were multiple projections happening in the plaza. We were not the final designers Design for the plaza, although we had conceptualized mm -hmm. it uh, with this project yeah. and with the television project um, and the kind of opening up of the television studios onto the plaza. So the idea is that the building has dark skin. So at dusk, the building disappears and it feels like it's the outside is kind of uh, buildings this becomes an invisible element and then the light from the inside becomes the kind of the prominent element of the uh, building. And this is kind of a study model, fi final study model of the site and then detailed models of the lighting of our design of the plaza. And sort of thinking very carefully about the weight of certain spaces, the um, the radio station needed all of its broadcasting components to be completely separate from the other aspects of the building. So there's a kind of doubling of structure in terms of vibration and sound. Um, and so we wanted to express the components of the building that were the service core and express the, the pieces of the building that were um, part of the um, production. Uh, and then they, uh, and, and you know, we had talked about a strategy of transparency, uh, kind of allowing people to see the work that's happening within the 
within the radio station because it's a protected space, a protected zone, because uh, you know there are incidents uh, where some you know have walked into radio stations to make demonstrations. <laughs> And this is the uh, photo of during co uh, construction with the cantilever seal structure. <laughs> so this was uh, kind of a moment of that value engineering uh, where the steel structure was meant to be, uh, the main structure was meant to be at the top and it was um, hung. Uh, and so we were down to like literally trying to save $30,000, I believe. <laughs> To, um, to flip the structure uh, to a different kind of support system um, supported by uh, you know, these large members at the bottom. Uh, in the end, there were difficulties with um, the camber. And I, I think we ended up spending a bit more rather than saving money from, from the hanging structure. But those were the kinds of- um, Complexity, kind of the negotiations. Negotiations that needed to happen during the project. And then here you could see that um, the, the glass walls of the outside of the uh, lecture hall could be pivoted and folded to become a kind of uh, allowing outside and inside to interconnect. It really was about connecting this public space of the radio station to the public space of the television station. I think there's one other model in the country mm -hmm. where radio and television are close together, but this is the only one where they're not owned by the same uh, entity, and yet there is this collaboration, and it and it was because uh, of the desire to bring in community. And then at the upper floors are the newsrooms and recording studios, and then offices. And you could see that the the offices cantilever out onto the street to have different view of the city. And these were just some early renderings that we did um, because we were working with the television station at the same time and they wanted to reimagine uh, their entryway. So the kind of balance of these um, two entry points was something that we talked about quite extensively. And then this is at the uh, upper level. This is third floor that has some uh, equipment and uh, recording studios. So here's just an image at night of, of an event um, when it first mm -hmm. opened. And then we were looking at the building has multiple uh, elevations, even the back is important. The reason is that it kind of looks to the corridor uh, alleyway that opens up during uh, certain events like the Fox Theater opens up, that's where everybody travels to, to the park. This is a, lobby area where the staircase and the lobby table becomes one and recording studio that becomes transparent. So you can see from multiple rooms. And then this is a kind of the front elevation. And our kind of relationship with uh, the television station uh, continued for many years and you know, recently we've been working on kind of reconceptualizing the, the rest of the interiors. Jack has, has wanted this project since uh, we first started working together. And sadly enough, um, we also uh, have, were commissioned to document and um, kind of rethink the plaza as a memorial for him. He passed away. Um, and, uh, you know, we've been working on uh, kind of a, a new entryway to kind of recognize him uh, in the plaza. So when we started, uh, the whole idea with Jack was that he loved the Umzone Grand Center building with a cantilever and he wanted Nine Network to kind of frame that element. So he wanted the lobby to kind of protrude out. At the same time, he believed the whole building of his facilities was so, such a kind of a uh, an armored uh, facade, he wanted the building to unfold and become more publicly engaged. So we started out with is that because these are all nonprofit organizations, we had to kind of talk through with the, the, the board members if they understood why Jack's commitment to renovating the whole building was an important factor. So here we designed these kind of uh, pamphlets and we have photos of every room and we walk through the spaces with the 
committee members to understand the issues about living and working in that space. And then he brought in a lot of different community members to that conversation uh, that also participated in, uh, but we, we again work through Nine Network um, in defining the kind of limits and scope of the project. So these were some kind of a quick diagrams just showing that how to renovate the spaces for more transparency and occupancy and gathering spaces. And here he, <laughs> Jack also wanted, how do you use the outside spaces for events around the TV station? And we started doing these kind of diagrams to understand the, what the expansion of the spaces would be like. And then renderings, and we were developing these renderings, not for the client, but for ourselves in sense we, we start to really engage and understand the detail of materiality and at the same, uh, how does the kind of the spaces get rendered out so we understand what we're designing, not just in plant, but in perspective. And this is the kind of the uh, midway between the level changes on the building. The lobby area was two feet higher than the rest of the building. So we were trying to develop a, a ramping strategy where ramp for the uh, ADA access becomes a kind of an exhibition space for media. You can see the rendering here is that it's a, uh, you can project onto a glass, clear transparent glass, and people will move through that space as an exhibition and getting information and data about the city. And here we were taking an existing fire escape and to minimize uh, the budget, we wanted to use the existing fire escape as a main fire, I mean, main uh, threshold up to the second floor. So we were taking the staircase and re renovating it using different kinds of components and materials. And you can see the fire escape become, say, kind of a main uh, stairwell that leads to the second floor. And this is an expansion to the boardroom and into the outside patio. So this was a complicated project because it's, um, you know, rehabilitating uh, an existing building uh, that had kind of many limitations to it. And so uh, it was a fairly precise sort of cutting mm -hmm. uh, of the building and also opening it up um, with views, glass, um, you know, air, uh, because the building was completely sealed and uh, with devoid of yeah. windows except on the Olive Street facade. Um, and those windows looked to a parking lot and they looked to um, SLU, uh, which is, you know, a university institution uh, completely sort of closed off from anybody on the street. So we try to make even the patio between the patio and then the outside into a kind of event space. and perforating it with more glass and windows for people so people will feel it's an open space. And this is the new entry in the back. The reason we need to work on that was that uh, KTC felt you need a second entrance that had multiple different kind of sectional relationships. And here, this is how uh, ramps and staircases that become event spaces and gathering and trying to welcome the community into the building in a different corner. Uh, this was all around, uh, kind of built up around mm -hmm. healthy eating. Mm -hmm. um, so there was to be a, a sort of uh, filming area uh, where cooks were going to be, or chefs were mm -hmm. invited from around the world uh, to demonstrate um, different ways of, of kind of preparing food and working with the local uh, gardens and community centers, uh, kind of promoting the idea of access uh, to food also because we have um, food deserts uh, in St. Louis and also differential pricing. Um, and uh, so they wanted uh, to do more to think about uh, kind of different aspects of our life and pulling everybody together around um, those topics. And one of the biggest uh, program requirement was a cafe for the, 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 the staff of the TV station because currently they don't have any place to gather and eat together. So these are, are the plans um, and you can, you can see through some of the cuts um, trying to open up some of the spaces, even the interior was 
predominantly focused around the, the studio environment and um, most everything else was sealed up into individual compartments. And, and the way in which the organization worked was very much in closed offices. And uh, there was the desire to completely open up um, you know, the television stations similar to the project that we had done uh, kind of early on. Uh, and this is not, and these are not new ideas, mm -hmm. but they were uh, kind of moments of change um, for this institution. So like uh, ex we took out existing walls and made it into glass to see the equipment so people understand what was happening in the TV station. This is also a time when public television is suffering mm -hmm. a decline. And so, uh, you know, we did many studies looking at different business models mm -hmm. that could be inserted within public television mm -hmm. to support them financially. Um, so the partnership uh, kind of com was very complex. Yeah. And this is a room that's that's for the community for learning and uh, experiencing uh, digital media. And another kind of common space where other kind of equipment like a master control room and everybody could kind of come and see what's going on. And this is a second floor level where we, Sorry, yeah, sister. that's the exit, uh, first project we did. And the second project was to re renovate the whole floor and to really design how people worked <laughs> in this space. And here we were looking at how to design these kind of new pod systems that they could work off from. And we were studying visual privacy, sound buffering, and how it relate to uh, sitting in, in on uh, chairs for long uh, period, how they could move around the space. And here you could see that there's a different kind of localization. So, the pots aren't all homogeneous, they're slightly different. So it feels like a different neighborhood or zoning. And these are kind of a meeting rooms for people to gather and they could use multiple surfaces in meeting. So I think we said earlier, but um, this project was really, uh, you know, conceived of television station, radio station, and a project called Art Walk all at the same time. Um, and uh, we uh, competed for this project uh, that was supported by the National Endowment for the Arts, uh, and it was called Art Walk, and we were asked to sort of stitch together a, a series of different spaces that were owned by uh, uh, institutions, so SLU, um, the Scottish Rite, uh, public television, public radio, um, the Sheldon Art Galleries, um, the Pulitzer Foundation, and the Contemporary Art Museum, and, and, Fox, Theater. and Fox Theater, and to create a, a pathway that, again, went to the Hodiemont mm -hmm. Uh, trail, uh, which was intended uh, along spring to connect us to the bigger kind of greenway efforts. Um, there is the Brickline project, which is happening right now in the city, and we like to think of this project as a space of meditation about that. Um, this project did not materialize, but I think uh, was an important conversation piece uh, with a lot of members of the community. And our desire was really to take things like that are separate, separated islands and to be able to stitch together this infrastructure and landscape and to take advantage of the beautiful buildings that we have in St. Louis uh, that can be kind of moments of uh, kind of physical space yeah. in the city that are celebrated. So what we try to do is kind of design these islands, but at the same time designing the kind of the landscape and infrastructure. So there were a lot of ramps and staircases that needed to be developed because there was uh, so many different kinds of elevation changes within the whole site. And many American cities face this challenge of the automobile kind of culture and the predominance of these parking lots. And we also have in St. Louis gated streets um, and gated communities. And so again, we wanted to open that up, um, thinking about how you change those sort of gated um, kind of public semi-public parking environments into activity zones uh, and then use the kind of building facades as backdrops um, you know to those to those spaces so it, it, on one hand it was designing the landscape the the kind of urban infrastructure um, kind of we were also asked to think about it as an entertainment space that would bring people to the city uh, and it was called Art Walk because there was an idea about engaging art 
there was a big debate in this project about um, placing art on the walkway, literally art walk with art uh, kind of sculpture pieces. And ironically, the, the kind of the artists were arguing that uh, we didn't need to put art on the art walk. Um, in fact, the, the community was, was mm -hmm. part of that and the buildings themselves, the environment, um, for us to think more uh, kind of esoterically, but also just to, to think about media and community and uh, gathering um, as an artistic endeavor, uh, it, it changed our perspective on the project. So these are diagrams of different kind of elements that we were designing, like light wells, boardwalks, lights, uh, canopies, signages place for truck, uh, food trucks to gather, playgrounds, even garbage dumpsters and bike racks and water fountains and ramps and staircases. And these are the different kind of design elements. Like you can see that we're taking on the landscape or even a parking garage, we use it as a compass. So people could be on a deck looking down at the uh, parking garage that has kind of a description of where to go in the city. And the hard part was to take some of these moments that are very different and problematic in their own kind of physical limitations and to have it read as though it's a continuous um, sort of journey that allows the kind of uniqueness of each uh, kind of corner or each institution to really shine and open itself up to the public. So of those institutions, they all agreed uh, to, to make their uh, Kind of community uh, open up uh, to this landscape uh, and that was uh, part of the motivation of them coming together as an entity um, so the client wasn't uh, it wasn't grand center itself although grand center was one of the clients um, but we covered public property private property um, and so how you negotiate that with um, with those players um, was really interesting. So we were working on the uh, entrance to the Pulitzer Foundation, the Contemporary Art Museum, redeveloping the planters and the streetscape. And here even gates and doorways into these buildings were reconfigured. And like we said, uh, like there's so many great changes you needed to develop kind of ADA access into these buildings that were built 100 years ago. And also, uh, you know, to place a bench in Grand Center was controversial um, because of uh, kind of the worry that people would start to assemble. So there were many conversations that happened with the community about um, the fact that, you know, you, you actually can't sit down, uh, you know, for blocks. Yeah. And these are renderings of uh, seasons changing and how the back of historical be buildings become a place for a kind of gathering. And then we designed through building this huge 20 foot model <laughs> that we use as a way to understand scale and detail and uh, how people occupy. But it was also just a great vehicle for conversation. Mm -hmm. um, and then we also worked on quarter scale models of all those kind of detailed places. So people understand how the detail of the landscape interface with the, uh, the components of the art walk project. And one of the last St. Louis projects we wanna talk about is one that just recently finished. Mm -hmm. it's, um, it's called COCA, the Center of, 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 of Creative, Creative Arts. Arts. <laughs> Sorry, I had a blank. Um, and it is in addition to the Eric Mendelssohn building, uh, which was originally a synagogue. Um, and it's, it's located both in St. Louis and on mm -hmm. the kind of suburb uh, side of St. Louis. Um, but a really important historic building um, that in the 80s was converted to a creative arts learning center. Um, and you can see from these original drawings, the Mendelssohn curve and kind of the precision of the structure and the lightness of it. In fact, the building structure uh, is made up of um, small vertical columns located within the mullions of the windows. Um, so there are certain kind of modernist principles that are uh, really important uh, here. Um, but it's also just so interesting that he really believed in um, kind of this attentiveness to, to nature and, and man's relation to democratic communities. And he was advocating, uh, you know, in a time uh, of modernism for a, a greater social agenda. 
um, that talked about the psychological conditions of existing in a building and really emphasizing this idea of the sensitive architect um, that is not working to produce an icon, but rather thinking about an integrated uh, community. So this is a site plan, how you can see how much density of um, green spaces and vegetation there is, but at the same time, uh, coca is in, it's a kind of a mediation between the residential neighborhood and into the kind of the commercial side of the uh, town. So COCA as an organization is one of the most uh, diverse populations, um, you know, in the city. They have, uh, they have programs where kids come after school and they actually receive tutoring. They, they live here. Uh, you know, many kind of pre-professional students will come after school and spend six days a week uh, in these programs. So not only are they providing the kind of dress for um, students who might have, might, may, sorry, might not have the resources, but also they're providing the, the tutoring, the academic uh, sort of support and infrastructure that they need to be successful at school and successful in the arts. Um, and the kind of group of collaborators is uh, wide and diverse. So when we started this project, we wanted to understand what the, it's, uh, this project was a kind of a uh, institutional project where had a huge board members and we wanted to understand what do they thought of the expansion should be. And these were kind of notes that we got. And this was our conceptual design. And it was probably one of our kind of a modest attempt to kind of hide the building and make the underground space to become the theater. And it was also important to us at the time that the, the project separate itself from the mass of the, the massing of the Eric Mendelssohn building. Um, and again, kind of respond to the, the curved um, space, but uh, in, a, in, a subtle, in a subtle way and protect the kids with a drop off. Um, you know, there was this very busy street out front and, and the kids were kind of challenged in terms of drop off and, and pick up time um, because we have young uh, kind of participants all the way up to high school. And this is a kind of a, a conceptual design planning, uh, how we separated the drop off as a kind of a mediating space between the existing Mendelssohn and the new building. And then the green roof deck that became a kind of a outdoor theater. In this particular version, the kind of garden space uh, was something echoed, which was really important to Mendelssohn uh, because it was sort of the center of community life mm -hmm. and the kindergarten and the original plans um, was placed adjacent to the gardens. Uh, and he wanted everyone to have visual access, uh, you know, so that this idea of that mediating landscape, um, you know, is really prominent. Um, we then ran through a, another scheme, uh, you know, that consolidated the building, but still held uh, like a gap um, in between the two projects. And we then also were uh, kind of joined by a large team of consultants and uh, again, an architect of record working with them to rethink this project. And so the project became consolidated uh, it moved up out of the ground, um, sort of competing with the Mendelssohn, but, but still separated by a garden space. So we were looking at how to design the staircase as a kind of a, a monumental experience of changing in section and the, how to work with the studio and then how the parents actually are able to observe their children practicing and how to make the hallways into a kind of a place where parents and children who, who are waiting for their siblings to kind of finish their practice. And then <laughs> we had to redesign because we found out the COCA were not able to uh, get their hands on the two existing buildings they told us they would be buying. So this was uh, just another sort of uh, kind of moment in the project where we had a full team working on one strategy and then the uh, kind of land deal fell through for one of these buildings. And so we were asked 
exact same square footage, um, but could you do it with one third less site area? Um, so as you can imagine, that was a bit of a challenge, especially up against the Mendelssohn building. So the project needed to completely be compressed and the kind of gap space uh, eliminated. And you can, you can see how that impacts uh, the section. Still, we were trying through the kind of form and separation of materials to elongate uh, those elevations uh, to play down some of the height and scale issues with a very low residential neighborhood surrounding um, and also to pay respect uh, to the Mendelssohn project um, that is here. So we did a lot of diagramming and design strategies just looking at how the massing could play within the context of the neighborhood scale. And that these are some drawings and physical models of the, uh, the theater. And that these are elevations and sections of the space. And these are elevations of the uh, back of the building and then side. And we were using these kind of renderings to really study how the space could be used for the client. And these are the kind of uh, photos of the built conditions. And the challenge was this area here, number three and number six, as we thought about how the uh, project came together along that uh, kind of moment of stitching uh, the project. And this is second floor with a kind of a green garden on the roof deck. So what we did was we uh, kind of worked it out where the first floor met uh, and, and went right up against the building, but the second floor, had a kind of roof garden kind of carved out of it, which then allowed us um, to separate from that building facade. So we weren't taking, we weren't going over the Mendelssohn building uh, by the new, with the new addition. These are the kind of the final photos of the, uh, the expansion built. You can see how we try to play with the kind of materiality of the existing. This is another building with very, very high spaces due to the programmatic requirements of, of uh, a full, it's not a full fly um, space, but a large fly space, um, you know, at the rear of the building is really setting some of the heights uh, here. So I think this is one of the last project yeah, we're gonna talk, yeah. This one is a Silver Lake International High School in Hangzhou, China. And when we visited the site, we were really kind of, you know, kind of surprised by the, the tea farming on the mountains and this amazing amount of kind of humidity that created this kind of uh, fog around this uh, landscape. And then they were actually building a new campus for International High School for the whole city of Hangzhou. And we were, kind of asked, how do you develop a, a building of that magnitude? And we were looking at Chinese paintings with all these kind of layers of fog and uh, hum humidity in the painting. And that's the kind of uh, experience we wanted to create. So we were using misters and uh, light towers to kind of understand how do you bring the temperature of the site down because Hangzhou is extremely hot and humid. Yeah. And then you could see here how the light mist, uh, the lights would be used at night, but during the day, daytime, how to keep the temperature down, the misters would create this kind of a foggy environment. And then this is kind of understanding the what the campus is like within the mountains. And you could see our kind of a conceptual sectional drawing is almost like the Chinese painting with the kind of the landscape of the existing condition and how it plays out with the fog and the, the mist. And we were looking at Chinese uh, kind of a building uh, structures of courtyards. How do you make a building very con consecutively bring in a lot of light because they gave us a kind of a code for making classrooms in China. At the same time, we were looking at the, the campus scale. You could see the existing buildings having the same width as our building. We were asked not to kind of duplicate mm -hmm. the image uh, of the campus, mm -hmm. um, but to make the high school uh, kind of stand out yeah. as, as something different and to keep the scale of the classrooms and the access to operable windows mm -hmm. um, with passive strategies mm -hmm. uh, kind of within the kind of realm of, of the local mm -hmm. region. 
And at the same time, we wanted to kind of layer in the landscape so that it's not just a building and hardscape, but how does the landscape live within the folding of the building? What's interesting in the plan is that uh, the Chinese institutions have hierarchies. So the upper floors are the, the principal and the, the faculty, and the layer underneath it are the upperclassmen, and the way at the bottom are the lower class. And these are the sections showing the kind of the longitudinal and then the transversal in relationship to the garden. And the garden is really important because it brings in life and light into the campus. And you can see in the classroom, because the building is quite narrow, you have light coming in from one side and then from the corridor, you get more light. And you can see that uh, certain spaces are rendered the view to the gardens. And then uh, there's cafeterias that have, these are kind of mundane generic spaces, but we wanted to have the view to the gardens constantly. And these are kind of the photos of the uh, final image of the, uh, uh, the final model at night. And this is a model photo of the, the major staircase leading up to the uh, campus entrance. And then this kind of folding landscape uh, elevation that brings people up to the uh, upper level. And this is a kind of the massing from the roadside. And then this is a current construction state right now. Um, so we wanna you know, close here. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, this project was a project that, uh, you know, I don't know if you want to talk about it. the kind of complications mm -hmm. of it, but again, uh, being a small practice, being academics, um, I think it leads to uh, kind of certain issues of, of scale. Mm -hmm. There are certain things we can do within academia, uh, research projects that, um, you know, can engage the community in, in more direct ways. Also uh, kind of affords us opportunities to think about uh, bigger questions in architecture competitions. Um, and, you know, at the same time, we really appreciate our time working with, with clients really closely. And most of our work has been centered around media and the arts. Although, you know, we have a lot of projects that are, um, in a different kind of speculative vein. And, you know, it because of the traveling during the pandemic and how they changed our client <laughs> structure during the process that, you know, projects like this are pretty difficult for us to execute the way we want to, because it's so far away, we can't, you know, leave our teaching commitment <laughs> and kind of, you know, get involved with the client in a very intimate matters. Yeah. So thank you very much. I think we're we're open yeah. for questions. Oh, thank you guys. Uh, this is really great work, and uh, really, really, really appreciate your time and um, to put all this together for us. We do have some uh, great questions already, and uh, I have a couple lined up as well. But I'd like to jump in and and ask uh, Tim. And I apologize, I don't know your last name from this. So if Tim would the uh, would be willing to come online here and ask your question from the chat. Thanks. Yeah, I really appreciate uh, your work and especially stitching together a community that uh, is ravaged by people leaving it. I've been through that area of St. Louis. And my question is a lot of your, the early projects you showed talk about gathering people together, bringing people together, yet you cited like the Fox Theater, people came and went. Um, and some of the work that you've done, does it, does it still promote that coming and going or is it, do you see this as a nucleus for people to move back into the area for residential stuff to start taking place to repopulate that part of the, of the city as, as a vital area of St. Louis? So I'm just curious your thoughts on that. There is a project that we didn't show called On Olive that's located in Grand Center. It's an effort of um, the Emily Pulitzer. She's brought together a number of, of artists and architects, architects really working um, kind of on housing, uh, kind of right next to that media arcade site that we showed. Um, and these are how, uh, kind of architects practicing from you know, around the world. Uh, and uh, there have been some local competitions. So it's local architects and uh, kind of international architects. Um, you know, that project's very special. Um, however, I will say that 
uh, you know, there is an organization called Beyond Housing in St. Louis um, uh, and the Brown School and also our public health uh, have, have worked with them and engaged them. Um, the university is very interested in thinking about um, housing in St. Louis. Um, but again, it's, it's quite complex because there is the creation of jobs that is needed. There is the, um, uh, you know, there's community work that is needed. Um, these partnerships are really important. So as the university is thinking about how we can have greater impact understanding all of those connections and really kind of not being WashU stepping in and kind of fixing something, but rather how do we step back <laughs> and, and maybe listen more, maybe be the people that support others um, in, in, in their uh, kind of preliminary work. Um, and so I, I think that you know, we're in a state of uh, trading the ground carefully. <laughs> and some of our earlier projects, you know, I said, I admitted we were very naive. Uh, you know, we had a client um, and we were responsive to our client and we were very thoughtful about engagement, but, um, you know, it, we didn't have as many voices at the table as I think, um, you know, we could have in retrospect. So we're just in a different, we're, di we're in a different time right now. And need to be much more sensitive. Yeah. And, you know, for us, if any of our design investigation could allow people to come to St. Louis and stay for a little bit, <laughs> so it's not a, just a destination, but it's a place to, you know, I mean, they could kind of hang out and experience it. And if that happened, that I feel like we did our job because a lot of people outside the city, they just come in for sports events and entertainment, they leave. So it's like an empty place. But if we could keep them for a little longer and experience the kind of the dynamics of urban living would be great. Great. Um, Matt McCrell, I see you have a question, but I wanna jump real quick to Andy Huber who raised his hand here. So uh, has a question as well. Andy, if you'd like to come online here. Hi, Andy. While we're waiting on Andy, <laughs> feel free to keep your hand up there. Um, I'm going to go to Matt. Matt, um, your question, and I know that you have a relationship with these guys, so I'll let you let you go here. Thanks, Dave. Um, Sung Ho and Heather, uh, number one, thanks for putting this together. Uh, glad to see that everything is going well out in St. Louis. Um, but as a practice, you guys look at a variety of scales from the details of the furniture that you talked about in um, at, at uh, the media building uh, to the kind of that master planning scale. Um, can you explain how the design process that you go through allows you to switch scales and uh, how that impacts the design uh, of the outcome? Basically, you know, we don't have, you know, a lot of people say they do residential or commercial. We don't have that kind of perception. We think of, you know, a furniture is a master plan. <laughs> like we, there's no distinguishing factor. We design through kind of making. So Heather could sketch and we could make little study models and we make digital models and we render it to see if those are well fitted in the site or the situation we want. So there's a lot of making process that allows us to solve these kind of issues of detail. And being an academic practice, I think uh, affords us the time to maybe spend more time on representation, which is a great communication tool. Um, Sung Ho and a lot of his collaborators uh, make exquisite models, right? And you can just imagine yourself in that space. And I think that really contributes to the conversation. We were that generation that was, you know, we made everything by hand. And then, you know, in our graduate education, everything flipped yeah. to being digital. So we're very much interested in uh, kind of new uh, techniques in uh, thinking about media and different spaces that we can occupy to understand projects better. Um, through different forms of media and technology. Um, but we love uh, kind of the craft of, yeah. of making things. Yeah, I can attest to having had a chance to see you guys' studio. The models are, are beautiful and uh, couldn't stop gawking at them. So along with a the great design, so, but instead. Um, 
one of the things I caught during the presentation was a phrase about the town square being the public forum, right? And that that's a place where people can go to air out their grievances or get together. And, and historically that's been that way. Um, a follow-up on that is maybe what are some keys aside from the things, or maybe to elaborate on the things that you've talked about here for encouraging that to happen and somehow maybe making them stick around a little longer or um, yeah, something along those lines. Like what are, what are some of the success stories that uh, is it just a matter of some benches and getting past that, <laughs> you know, I can see the bench war, but it shouldn't happen, but it, I'm sure it did. So. I think uh, we need to spend a lot more time and, and thinking about programming and making spaces that are flexible and can change over time. Um, we, you know, uh, the, we've been fortunate that the institutions that we've worked with, like their core mission is about um, education, uh, you know, community. And so they're really involved in programming. <laughs> so they set up forums, they set up um, kind of uh, entertainment uh, to, to bring people together. They set up discussion groups. Um, they, you know, the public media gave everybody cameras that they could go out in their neighborhoods and report and then they come back and then they, they you know, they demonstrate what they've seen um, kind of on the big screen. They actually help them with the editing. Uh, you know, to tell their stories. Um, so, you know, it was part of our job to make a space that celebrated their stories when, when they came to light. Um, but again, you know, I don't know if you can attribute that to us as much as you can attribute that to the partnerships that we've had that are heavily invested in programming with their communities. Yeah, it's like, you know, social media and way people communicate is radically different 10 years ago than now. And I think that's why these kind of media institutions are reopening their doors to the public and re-engaging the public radically different than they did 10 years ago even. Mm -hmm. You know, I've, I've witnessed technology just being able to allow people to have, they seem to be more comfortable doing, making commentary on Zoom community meetings than they are standing up in a giant room of 150 people and, and speaking their voice. So there's like a blend going on. And there's a lot of discussion, right, about big D versus little d, you know, that community, that that heavy programming listening up front. And then the design will follow after that. And uh, I think as architects, we learn that in school, but sometimes we forget, right? We forget that stuff. Yeah. I think that's also a foundation of some of the work that um, Sungho did, mm -hmm. you know, on those media projections where people who didn't have a voice um, could speak in an intimate space, um, but then their kind of their face and their thoughts or their hands yeah. were projected at such a large scale that they cannot be ignored. Um, yeah. I, you know, and that was, what year was? 2004, 2000. Do you see, um, I think I know the answer, so maybe it's a leading question, but in terms of Art Walk um, and that project, as being something um, eminently translatable to other communities, but not specifically translatable. Sort of like the Highline is conceptually translatable, but not specifically. Um, and the way you guys have worked with all of those groups to weave all that together was really strong. Do you have any advice for people, uh, for the rest of us that are out there trying to make those community, you know, everyone says, oh, we need to connect this to this to this. And then they walk away from it and just expect it to happen. So what, what advice do you guys have for that? Well, I, you know, I've just been on advisory committees, but the, I think one example to look at is the brick line um, in St. Louis. Uh, um, there's, it used to be called Shoto Greenway, uh, the project, uh, there was a competition. They've met with over 300 community groups um, I mean, it's just phenomenal what they've done. They're stitching together the city um, through greenways and bike trails and uh, kind of really uh, engaging artists, Mill Creek Valley, uh, kind of demonstrating lost histories, lost stories of the city. Um, you know, I, I think that that is a model. Uh, you know, our project was preceding that by, by many years, but uh, you know, I like to hope it played some small part in kind of raising those kind of conversations with community members um, who are heavily invested, you know, in the brick line today. Um, 
it certainly was educational yeah. for us in yeah. terms of how we think holistically yeah. about the city. Yeah, I, I, I think that for Art Walk, the amazing part was not the design, but the conversation we kind of yeah. able to uncover and then the needs of the individual institutions and how they could communicate using our design to collaborate with each other. That's the strong part mm -hmm. of the process. I know one of our learning objectives talked about fostering the will of public and private stakeholders to reimagine, connect, and invest. One question I had come in, and I think you an coming into this, I think you answered it was, is it fostering the will of the public or is it forcing the will of the public? <laughs> and uh, it definitely sounds more of fostering it, right? It's getting the ball rolling, but then people want to get on board. Yeah. Yeah, I, th I think that large institutions are taking a step back in a healthy, healthy way. Um, because you know we need to be better partners yeah yeah well does anybody on the call here have any uh any further questions i'd like to just feel free to raise your hand and we will um we will see that little yellow hand pop up if you like but if not i want to really thank you guys for this uh i was really looking forward to this one all summer long and uh um on behalf of all of AIA Ohio, seriously. Um, and I think I will uh, maybe perhaps turn it back to Karen. We didn't practice the end of this, you guys, so we can tell. <laughs> <laughs> if, and uh, so I guess we won't do that. But in any case, um, thank you all for joining us. Make sure that you hit the link to fill out your uh, CEU credit um, for tonight and uh, or this afternoon. And uh, we will... See you for the next series for AI Ohio on practice innovation. And uh, Heather and Sung Ho, you're welcome to join in on those two if you want, but you could teach us some more things on uh, practice innovation. So thank you guys very much. And everyone have a great night. Thank you. Thank Bye. You.